And now, to the millions and millions of listeners and viewers all across the world, it's the That's Not Christian Podcast. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. we, need, we, need, real. we need that's those real, in the man. industry man I can, I can i can speak on that in a little bit if you want to whenever i get to uh you know we get to where i'm kind of talking about how i got into the christian hip-hop and left the secular world because um i've seen a lot you know in the secular world and and god god literally spoke to me i've heard the voice of god like three times in my life that wow one while i was awake and twice in dreams and it was the same voice, you know, and it led me and I followed and, and things changed, you know, for the better. Yeah. And um, I guess I'll speak on a little bit. One thing was I was down in, in the industry in Atlanta. That's where I was. I worked with T.I., you know, everybody from T.I., Yogati, been in parties with everybody like Diddy and, and all, you know, Jeezy. Dang. I recorded everybody. You know, I was always in the studios. We were going from the studios to clubs, the studios to clubs, studios to clubs. Yeah. 24 seven, you don't sleep, you take naps, you know, that's how it was. Wow. wow. And so the, the thing about it was, was, um, my spirit wasn't filled the, you know, my spirit was empty and, and I'm, I come from a, a family of Christians, family of ministers, family of missionaries, family of preachers, you know, like, but all, all loving agape love, you know what I'm saying? Grace, uh, right. no matter how much I screwed up in, in life. We love you. You know what I'm saying? That, that's right. what, back to God was that agape love. Um, and so, you know, I was down in Atlanta, man, I was just working my butt off. Everyone on Facebook, oh man, you made, it. I was on TI's show, you know, if, oh, I see you on TV, you made, <laughs> yeah, but you don't, no one knew what my spirit was going through, you know, right. saying? I was actually more really spiritually being tormented because I was around so much evil. Um, when it comes to the music, you know, gangs, uh, gang members, you know, and I just kind of went along with the ride, you know what I'm saying? I'm riding around with people that I trusted with my life, you know what I'm saying at the time, but, um, it was very spiritually demeaning and, uh, I was kind of depressed. I was asleep on the couch. I had this dream. I was, I was uh, living with my homeboy, big country, the TI's best friend. Mm -hmm. And I had this dream and it's the end of the world. And I was like in California and like this bomb hits and it comes and hit and this, this waves coming towards us and all these people are outside. And then all of a sudden they, they start running and I'm sitting there looking and running. It's like a nuclear wave coming towards us. And next thing you know, they stop and they turn around and they look in the sky and it's like, God had a keyboard and he typed, he's like, you only get one chance. That's that those words came up in the sky. You only get one chance. Wow. And everyone started chanting. You only get one chance. You only get one chance. And then the wave hit us and we die, you know? And so, it, you know, normally when you, you get hit in a dream or something, you wake up or you fall, you wake up. Well, I didn't wake up. And I went to where I'd been before and it's kind of like outer space. And the voice of God came to me and he said, you need to leave this place. He's like the people you're with, they don't have the same morals as you. They weren't raised like you. They don't want to know me. It's like, if you stay here, you will be trapped. He's wow. like, go home. I have something for you. And I woke up and I was just like, mm. what? I was like, am I back? Right. All of this, everything I worked for, you know, I'd work, I worked years to accomplish to get to where I was, you know, just to try to keep going and going and going, being a, a bigger and bigger and bigger engineer, engineer and producer in the industry. And I just got on my knees, started praying. I was like, God, if that was you, you got to give me a sign, whether it's verbal, whether it's, it's something move around here. Or you make me feel something. <laughs> All right. I'm saying. And I got quiet for about 30 seconds and, and about 30 seconds later, the same voice is like, like a reverse reverb comes in. like, uh, go, I just jump up, start packing my clothes. You know, I call my boy country. I was like, Hey bro, I, was, I, th I think I'm going back to North Carolina for a little bit. Oh yeah, bro. Go ahead. The album's done. You know, you're good. Go handle your business. There was no, there was no like, um, ah, oh, man, you can't leave. Nothing like that. You know what I'm saying? Nothing trying to hold me back. Mm. And, uh, so I left, left the industry and on the white ride home, I, I kept thinking about that dream. And I remember God saying, if you stay here, you're going to be trapped and, um, and trap music. 
You know what I'm saying? Uh, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And and when I look at it, the people that were down there, I used to talk about God and, and I used to ask people, well, you believe in God? You know what I'm saying? I ask country, you believe in God? Yeah, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in God. No one reads the Bible. You know what I'm saying? No one really talks about Jesus. You know, they believe in a higher being and all that stuff, kind of spiritual. Mm-hmm. And, um, but since I left there, you know, I've been blessed. I got a wife, house, car, you know, clothes, food, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Everything on my own, right. without, you know, on anybody. Um, so yeah, you know, the, the whole, the one thing with the secular music and, and the people that were down there is I still see them is they, they are trapped in that lifestyle. You know, they literally are like going to the strip club. That's, that's breakfast. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. right. You go, Oh, where's the studio? Hey, let's go to the club real quick. Go to the club, shoot T.I. Young Thug. They perform real quick. Okay. Let's go back to the studio. Boom. Go back to the studio. And, you know, it's just, that's just a normal life. Um, and it's, it's hard to reach people that are in that lifestyle, especially so deep into it. And it's like you said, uh, switch, like you might, I, I'd more likely reach a producer or engineer, someone who's trying to come up, you know what I'm saying? Like me and trying to make it more than reaching someone who is so far in the industry. They've got their riches. They got the people yeah. around them. They got the industry around them telling them like, nah, man, don't listen to that kid. You know what I'm saying? He ain't, he's just mad. He ain't us. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. right. Mm-hmm. Fire you the next day. Exactly, exactly, and that's how it is. So it's it's hard to reach uh, people once, they, especially once they've made it to a certain level, because they don't want to be reached. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they got to sustain that lifestyle too, because yeah. the last thing they want to do is give it give all up. up. Everything. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. It's like that yeah. rich man, right? Who right. Jesus asked to sell his possessions and come follow him, and he was like, <laughs> uh, yeah, huh? "Like, huh? what? It's easier for a camel to go through a eye of a needle, right?" Mm, yeah. yeah yeah that's nuts that's so crazy. so what what so in that transition uh view what like you you mentioned you finished an album for somebody and then you was like okay god spoke to you and then you was out so before that um during the making of the album and all this other stuff like what was the wrestle like like what was like was this something that uh was occurring once that particular album was finished or throughout that whole process, you were just like, you know what? I, I, I need to do something like this doesn't feel right. This is, you know, so maybe you could touch a little on that. I mean, it's almost like I can, I can definitely like feel a difference between now and then, you know what I'm saying? Like with what I'm doing now compared to then the wrestle was, was constant. Like, um, just like I'm missing something, you know, like I believed in God. I knew, I knew God, but I say most of the time when I was down there in the industry, I wasn't reading my Bible because I wasn't around others who were, I wasn't being encouraged to read my Bible. Right. You know, I believed in Jesus, you know, I believed in God. I, I wasn't into it. I wasn't going to church. So it's more of a, um, like an inner struggle. Like, and then I, I always felt like I didn't fit in, you know what I'm saying? I was white, you know what I'm saying? I was like one of the only white people other than like, my home, like Ti's, his uh, head engineer Elliot, a good friend of mine. You know, he's he's a uh, he's white and everything. But I I was running around with everybody. But and and just to be blatantly honest here, like I wasn't making no money. You know what I'm saying? I'm working with some of the some of these big artists. I'm getting a hundred dollars every couple of days or so. Oh, here, here you go, view hundred dollar bill. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, I just worked wow. for hours straight. You know, and and so I was wrestling with finances. That's one thing, but then just like spiritually, like going to the strip clubs and just realizing how, how much it was like, just like normal feeling for everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Like that was the last, I felt like, man, I just don't feel like I'm supposed to be here. You know, I just feeling like this, I'm just. That's that conviction, right? What's that? What's that, Jimmy? I I said, that's that conviction, right? That's that Holy Spirit working on you. Yeah. and, And, and so, um. Yeah, and I went through years of that, you know what I'm saying? That conviction and just not being fulfilled. And it just started wearing on me, wearing on me, wearing on me till I got into a state of depression. And then mm-hmm. while people are telling me, oh, you, you made it, you made it. Like, yo, I am depressed. Like, out of my right. depressed. And, and so it was, a, a, yeah, it was definitely a wrestle. Did now, you think about it? Did you, sorry, Switch. Did you think about it twice? Um when you heard, you know, God say, okay, just go, just go. I know you mentioned you packed up your stuff, you know, but was there like a little lapse? You were like, man, should I really, really leave all of this? When when, when I woke up from the dream, there, there was a wrestle there because I'm like, okay, maybe I'm just dreaming. You know what I'm saying? Even though I know I've heard that voice before, like right. maybe 
It could have been it could have been eating hot wings so late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, right? <laughs> it's a little indigestion. Yeah. And so I, that's why I got on my I literally like got on my knees and prayed like no one happened to be home at the time. It was just quiet. And uh, I just was like, God, you know, you got to give me a sign because if not, I'm staying. So there was a wrestle. But once he once I verbally heard that, whether it was my conscious or whatever it was. Right. Heard it clear as day. Go. I was like, don't tell us. <laughs> so literally that instant, that instant, you you was out. Pack my pack my bag, threw it in the car, called country. I'm going to work. I was wow. on. I was gone. And I wow. I never went to Atlanta since. And that wow, was wow. 2014, 2015. Wow. That's so dope. so um you had mentioned earlier that you came to Christ when you were 19, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So were you were you like on and off with with God and stuff like that? Was it like Yeah, it's like um was it like, oh, I just said this in his prayer just to say it? <laughs> <laughs> so so the, hearing the voice of God, um, all through high school, um, I started doing drugs in like tenth grade, you know, started smoking weed. Started smoking weed in like eighth grade, but then I started drinking, got into ecstasy, you know shrooms lsd like you know just partying party all through high school i uh, went five years because i quit one year after i graduated um you know i was on some pretty hard drugs all my friends were you know my whole town almost all my friends were and so i knew that i guess it was that summer i looked at myself in the mirror and i was like yo this is not who i'm supposed to be i looked terrible you know my face was sunken in i mean i was i was bad i was bad off i was a drug addict you know what i'm saying and uh right I knew that's not who I wanted to be. I knew that I was better than that. You know, I knew that I like, like God had, I, I just knew inside, like this ain't who I was raised to be. Even though I come from a, a you know, single mother household, three kids, you know, it wasn't easy. And so I did the one, one thing I only knew to do. And that was, uh, I thought about my grandparents, the God they love. And I just went to uh, my mom's house, went to the basement. I had a bed, locked myself in the room and opened the Bible. And I was like, it's the only thing I knew to do, you know? And, uh, started reading the Bible, you know, at night I would go through withdrawals. I was seeing demons in the corners of my eyes, you know, shadows, seeing little shadows. I was paranoid. Um, I was hearing voices and I oh, just go get some, you know, just, just go get something, go get something. It don't matter what it is. Just go get it. Go get some drugs. You know, you want it. You'll be okay. That's what I was hearing in, in my conscience. Wow. So I kept reading the Bible, you know, about went through about three, four nights of uh, withdrawals. And um, on the, I guess I think it's like the fourth or fifth like day. I don't know what time it was. I'm reading the Bible and I get to the Sermon on the Mount and I just happened to turn on the TV and the, the old school Jesus movie was on, you know what I'm saying? Where he's, you know, literally you're, you're, they're reading the Bible to you, you know, but it's the old school Jesus and it gets to the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm reading the Sermon on the Mount and I'm watching the Sermon on the Mount. I'm like, Oh, this is crazy. I'm like reading it. I'm seeing it. So I was like feeling it. And I literally like just like paralyzed, went into like a, a fetus position and a uh, fetal position. Wow and had an out of body experience. I seen myself laying there on my bed and um, I seen like a bright blue light just leave my body. And, and I thought I died, you know, I was like, oh, I'm dead. You know, I'm sitting here looking at myself, I'm dead. And the bright blue light goes up. It's like the outline of a hand going up and I just see like outer space stars, universes, and it's just going up, going up, going up. And I'm, you know, I'm completely sober at the time. Um, uh, I don't know how else to explain it, but it, it was very real. Next thing you know, this this white white hand, the outline of a hand, it's like bright white, comes and just grabs mine, and it's like whoosh, like the best feeling I've ever had. You know, like better than any trip, better than any drug. Mm. That's when the voice of God came to me, and He's like, "You called on me. I'm here. You know, you you turned your back on me. I never turned my back on you. I've always been here waiting for you. You're saved. You're healed. You're clean. No more addiction." And I'm, I know he said a lot more than that, um, but that's all the stuff I really remember. And um, he said, um, you know, I'll always be here. And so I come back in my body. I mean, it felt like I was there for like forever. Come back in my body. I'm still curled up. I can't break free. I finally break free. I start crying. You know, I cry myself to sleep. Woke up the next day and, um, you know, I'm trying to think like, yo, am I crazy? Like, did that really just happen? Like, is this real? Like, so I'm just waiting to hear the voices to tell me, go get a hit. Waiting to, to feel like I, that, that anxiety feeling that I need some drugs. You know what I'm saying? I sit up and I'm like, nothing. 
you know, I don't see no shadows. I'm not, I'm not no, no feeling of addiction. And, uh, I felt cleaner than I ever felt like a hundred percent clean, pure, you know, I was like, yo, like I've never felt this way before. And from that point, like, how can I deny God ever, you know? So no matter from that point, you know, um, that was towards the beginning um, of me getting into the music industry. So I started, I went to, ended up going to college, community college for piano and, and uh, vocal lessons. And that led me to meeting certain people that started a record label in my hometown and uh, pursuing the rap career, you know, recording rappers and everything like that. But even, even though my backslides throughout the time, I, I always knew God was there because how can I deny what happened to me? Right. right. And, and so, so yeah. Wow. That's crazy. It's, it's so, amazing. So, it's so amazing. you, so you were, you were going to, you started going to school and then that's how you got into the engineering. Um, yeah. Kind of like I, I've always been into music and I've always been into computers. So I did computer networking and engineering in high school. That's the one good thing I did in high school. You know, <laughs> I love computers. I was building them, networking. I helped build the school network and everything. I was always good with it. And then I was always, I played trumpet, played piano, guitar. I was always into music. So I just kind of put the two together. The community college I went to didn't have no engineering. They just had piano, vocals, uh, music theory. So I was learning kind of the classical music side there. But then I met my homeboy, Rabbit. Um, while while going to school, and he's like, "Yo, he was older. He wanted to start a rap record label. He knew rappers. I was like, well, I make beats. So we started a little label. And he's like, I was an engineer. He was the businessman. And oh, uh, nice. and so we, you know, everything I learned that was back in like '05. So there wasn't really YouTube. You know, if I wanted to learn compression or EQ, I go to the the Barnes and Nobles and pick up a book and read it. And go back right. and apply it. You know, and so just kept learning from there. Wow. So you had gotten so uh so talented that the uh the big names wanted to mess with you, huh? <laughs> it's, it's, it's what's really wild is my boy Rabbit. So my boy Rabbit, he he was killed back in two thousand nine by his own cousin. You know, it's pretty oh, sorry to hear that. Oh geez. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um she's female, stabbed him with a knife. She was crazy. He was oh, beating wow. her with a stopper. So that put a damper, but when he was alive, he used to he used to mess, you know, kinda like he, he, he was like a, a drill sergeant towards me. He was always like, where you at? We got work to do. You know, where, he had a real New York vibe to him. So he's like, where you at? We got work. You know, he's very fast. And let's, let's go, let's go, let's go. And so he was always on me. Um, if I wasn't at the studio, he won't know where I was. And why am I not at the studio? You know, and, and which I appreciate that now. Um, but he used to say, uh, you know, one day, one day you're going to work with, you're going you're gonna to work with T.I. Just want you to know that, you know, one day you're going to like, Yo, you're crazy. You're crazy. You know? And, uh, Next thing you know, I'm working with Ti. You know, oh, wow. so did you w w during that process? Like, did you think you would get a, uh, that opportunity to work with these artists? Like, was that a goal of yours? Like, to get so good? Yeah, yeah. It was always yeah. it was like like Ti in the South. You know, King of the South. Mm -hmm. So he yeah, yeah. he was huge in Hickory, where I'm from, Hickory, North Carolina. I mean, he if you were Ti was the biggest artist back then you know yeah. rapper as far as respected in the south you know if, if you're with ti you're with you're with the boss and so yeah the goal was always ti i'm gonna get ti on a beat you know i'm gonna record ti one day yeah so that that was uh i mean it's pretty wild that it ever did happen because of of who ti is to the south you know and and, and the the culture down there yeah he calls himself the king right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, oh, he's extremely talented you know and and uh T.I. was always real respectful, you know, to me and everything. So I, I have nothing bad to say about T.I. Um, you know, he's in the secular world. He's on that side. Um, but he was always real respectful. Um, most people I was around was real respectful toward me other than like, you know, financially, <laughs> you know, oh, right, right. Right. you get paid a hundred bucks. We'll go to the strip club and I'll see somebody blow $10,000, you know, right. like right. <laughs> That's right. crazy. Yeah. So tell tell us how does how does a dude from Hickory, right, get in contact with Ti and be like, yo, I'm a I'm an engineer for you. Like, how does that walk us through that? How does that happen, man? So so I just so happened to grow up with Big Country King's brother. His name's Trump. Um, he's from Hickory, mm -hmm. so him, him and Country got the same dad. So I after Rabbit died, I was kind of um, I took a couple months off. You know what I'm saying? Right. 
shed my tears and then uh, had a couple of dreams and, and was told to, to open a studio. So I opened another studio in Hickory and I started working with like, in a, you know, a couple of little clients here and there's not, there's not any money in Hickory really. So I wasn't making much, but the artist that I was working with with rabbit started coming back around and we started recording. Well, they, they, they would just started getting disrespectful. I tell them, yo, yo, don't smoke no cigarettes in my studio. You know, you don't smoke weed. That's cool. But no cigarettes. And they saying, you know, they're smoking cigarettes, you know, they, they just started getting more and more disrespectful. I'm like, yo, I ain't got to put up with this. Like, yo, yo, F Hickory, you know, I'm out. <laughs> right. I packed everything up and um, I started couch surfing for a little bit so I could figure out what I was going to do. Found out I had a, a great uncle who lived in Atlanta. I emailed him and uh, he's like, yeah, come on down. So I moved in with him. Trump found out I moved to Atlanta. He's like, yo, my brother just got a new house. He needs an engineer. Let me wow. link you. So boom, boom. They saying, you know, I'm at big country's house working with him. T.I. is in prison at this time. And uh, so, so, you know, I was around everyone who was around T.I., but T.I. wasn't there. Right. Wow. Um, you know, I just put in the work. And then once T.I. got out, country being one of his best friends, you know, we ended up being around him all the time. And uh, it just led from that, you know, to where there was times where, uh, I mean, I was in the studio with him quite a bit. But if Elliot, you know, wanted to get up and, and hey, view you good. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, go ahead. And, you know, I sit there and just record the track, and uh, you know, just went from there. Got a couple, got a got a couple of beats. He got on a couple of beats. They never really was released on an album or anything like that. So, the thing about Ti, he probably records like uh, like twenty to fifty songs a week. Wow! Like, wow! Non- twenty. Yeah, like there there were times. Songs? I, I'd say I'd say like I'd say average it's like twenty songs a week on on whenever he's like on it yeah yeah it's like no wow he'll he'll buy he'll book out three studios at a time like we'd be at we'd have tree sound studios we'd have patchworks we'd have um dart which is dallas austin studio and that way you know hustle gang he'd have like um like some artists in this studio some artists in this studio he'd be in this studio and they just circulate you know just so his work ethic was there (laughs) oh that's i mean the the that's why that's why he's so good is because he's always in the studio, always. Yeah. It's like so now with these songs, right? Like these artists, a lot of times they they do all these songs, right? And then they just handpick the best ones, right? Because a lot of them are just like, nah, nobody wants to hear that, right? <laughs> with him, it's a different story. He 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 definitely. He, he, He's definitely talented. He's got a lot of, he had a lot of really good songs that I was like, oh man, I can't wait to hear this come out. You know, at the time, you know, I was into that music and thing. Um, everybody else, I mean, yeah, you know, definitely. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of, a lot of that music that just sounds like the same old thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> same old thing over and over and over again. But, but yeah. for him, yeah, I mean, he's got, he's got so much music. It's crazy. It really is crazy. So did you, did you ever, uh, end up getting like compensated or like rewarded for your stuff eventually or basically my reward was considered i'm lucky to be there you know what i'm saying i did i got to go on tour with them you know with them a couple of times we travel with them and everything like that um so the reward was kind of like you know um I, I remember i remember being told it wasn't tip that told me this um but some i remember one time i said something like yo like am i gonna get paid <laughs> You ain't happy to be here? It's like, you know, you got a hundred other people over here that wish they were in your position. Wow. You gonna do your job or what? It's like, nah, I'm good. I'm, I'm gonna do my job. Do my job. Free labor, huh? <laughs> wow. That industry is with a lot of those, uh, a lot of uh, industry artists, you know, once they make it, like, they don't, I mean, it just seems like they feel, I'm not gonna speak for them and say they don't, but it just seems like they feel like they don't need to pay anybody because there's plenty of people who would do the work for them for free. Sending in line, right. Right. Did you did you get uh, album credits and stuff like that? Never got any album credits. I, I mixed some of GDOD2, um, recorded some of GDOD2. Um, you know, con- country country would shout me out. You know, country would give me some credit here and there. Um, yeah. Give me credit on some of his tapes and stuff like that, but never anything uh, album wise. Wow. wow. They would usually pay, usually Ray C. I don't know if y'all ever heard of Ray C. He's, he's like the main mixing engineer. Mm-hmm. The most stuff, even if it got mixed in house would get sent. Like if it's, if it's, if it's dropping album, it's going to get sent to like Ray C, someone like that. 